Hello. Uh, welcome to our student panel. Um, we're going to get things rolling along here right away. So uh, to my left, I have Max Alderman and Duncan, I'm sorry, what's your last name? Vickard. Vickard, um, with their proposal. So take the floor. Great, thanks. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I, Max and I wrote this amendment together. So I'm um, going to introduce it briefly, and then Max is going to talk about some of the ways that it might actually work in American law and some of the policy implications. Um, so what this amendment does is it provides a framework for delimiting rights limitations. Um, and um, it has four essential requirements. One is that any rights limitation has to be provided by a law. Um, and then it applies um, a three-part test uh, of requiring that the limitation be necessary um, and proportionate relative to a particular government objective and that the essential protection of the right remain um, also remain protected. And uh, I just wanted to, uh, to give some color to it, talk a little bit about how we came up for the idea for this amendment. Um, I, before law school, I uh, worked for a German organization um, that was uh, working in Tunisia in the aftermath of the Arab Spring. And a number of the um, members of the Tunisian Constituent Assembly were concerned about uh, constraints on executive power because their previous constitution essentially just said, you know, the, fr the freedom of speech will be protected except as provided by law. And then you can imagine what uh, a, dict a dictator did with that. Um, so uh, my, my organization, um, it has expertise in comparative constitutional law, and the German, uh, this, this um, scheme is uh, derived directly from the German constitution, uh, yes. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, has, and has also been repeated in a number of other constitutions in Europe, also South Africa, and the Tunisians adopted a scheme that is, that is really very similar to this. It's also found in international. And Canada. Well, so, so, so what's interesting, you know, we were really excited that uh, Professor Green present, presented on a similar topic, um, but uh, we think that there are several improvements that this scheme makes over the Canadian model um, as, as proposed yesterday and as in the Canadian Charter. Um, so just to, to kind of um, summarize some of the work that um, Professor Green did in his presentation, um, he noted that uh, the that, uh, that rights have limitations, um, that the way that the Supreme Court has dealt with finding those limitations in the American context has often been misapplied and is often inconsistent, um, that the Supreme Court has been reluctant to recognize new substantive rights because of the inability to find um, the barriers uh, to them, um, and that there's, a, there's this kind of binary nature of rights claims in American rights adjudication. Um, and we think that, the, that this scheme presents at least two improvements over the Canadian um, model uh, that I think anticipate some of the objections that you raised um, in, in your response yesterday. The first is that it spells out precisely the kinds of government interests that would be uh, subject to a proportionality analysis. So proportionality isn't just against two rights in some abstract notion, but it actually lists the specific interests that, ha that, that um, a law needs to uh, further, uh, and then courts can evaluate the proportionality of the rights restriction against those particular interests. Um, and this is, you know, uh, the, the interest that we listed here, it adds one to the German scheme. It's essentially what the Germans do. Um, but I think one of the exciting parts of this framework is that the idea is to talk about proportionality and then say that the Constitution should be the one, should be what spells out what those interests are instead of courts having to come up with determining what's a compelling state interest or not. And um, it's possible to then debate sort of what should be a compelling state interest and, and what shouldn't be um, in a way that courts often do. Um, and this leads to the second point, which is that uh, this amendment um, gives a greater role for Congress and, uh, and also for the citizens in determining what compelling state interests are. So you'll see that with regard to facial challenges to rights restrictions, Congress actually has a role in, in spelling out the exact ways in which the law that they've come up with is proportional to the objective that they want to achieve. And as mentioned, citizens have a, have a role in saying, um, 
exactly what those interests should be. So just to give one quick example of this, you know, the, the uh, First Amendment commercial speech jurisprudence has been, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in flux, uh, to say the least, since Central Hudson and, and, and then these, this plurality opinion in 44 Liquor Mart. And a lot of the debate, both within the Supreme Court and in lower courts, is whether things like consumer protection are, should, should be a compelling state interest or not. And this provides a framework for saying that actually citizens can say consumer protection is or isn't uh, a compelling state interest, um, and then proportionality can be can be fed into that. So um, I'll turn it over to Max. Yeah. Uh, and so our, our sort of hope here, as we devised this plan, was to not make it feel so alien as though it would be impossible to actually articulate within an American legal context. And I think that there are a number of strands that exist that endorse and promote the idea of proportionality through American jurisprudence. The first is potentially in the Dormant Commerce Clause as an analog, uh, and the second then might be in the Strict Scrutiny analog. Now in Dormant Commerce Clause, you really did see an articulation of states possessing a right to use their police power to regulate a market and then courts assessing the legitimacy of and importance of those state purposes, the necessity of the regulation, and then performing these kind of balancing tests to determine whether those are actually reasonable limitations. Now it seems then that when creating this kind of proportional analysis, you already have courts doing this kind of work. It happened in Railroad Co. v. Hewson, it happens in Minnesota v. Barber, and in Pike. This kind of early dormant commerce clause analysis then creates this sort of push towards proportionality where the courts not only feel qualified to do it, but also see it as an essential and primary practice of the judiciary. But, and I think more compellingly, it comes particularly important into the scrutiny area of our jurisprudence. Now, I, I kind of, I think, was motivated in part to work on this particular amendment because of the discomfort I felt and I felt that occurred in the court's jurisprudence in the Obergefell decision. Uh, there you saw a court that seemed deeply uncomfortable with the tiers of scrutiny as applied to kind of a suspect class, in part because when you decide what a suspect class is, you create a real ontological determination about that class, both giving it legal access and limiting its legal opportunities. There, then, you saw that we kind of tried to sidestep that decision by tying it to something like dignity. I think that this really does reveal, then, what are the deep and inherent problems of the scrutiny analysis in the first place, where you either thought that you had a dichotomous decision between rational basis review and strict scrutiny, in which some rights are given this very hierarchalized or kind of preeminent position, like our speech protections uh, or uh, discrimination against race, and then a rational basis review, which can still have really huge and, and deeply abiding consequences for people who have access to property, but the court doesn't provide any kind of analysis for that. Uh, and so then I think then you get to the gender context, which gave a weird and variegated form of intermediate scrutiny, and, and there are a lot of scholars, I think, in this room who know this much better than I do, but it, it resulted then in, I think, a, a vast spread of how the court wants to protect or think about rights that becomes truly obscurantist and doesn't actually provide much of a methodology or a framework by which you could articulate when and how you're protecting those rights. Uh, and so our hope then was that by providing a rule of decision within the Constitution, the courts are then better able to come up with a transparent metric by which they evaluate things that limit rights and have those consequences. It provides a step-by-step -step basis in which the Congress is uh, required to sort of identify the legitimate aim for their measure. It provides a reason that they have to give background and justification for the rights-limiting measure that they're taking, and that it also requires them to come up with less onerous ways of doing so in the first place, showing that the path that they're using is the one that's most appropriate to the problem and will achieve their ends the best. Then when the court reviews it, they have to go through a similar standard, making sure that those kind of ideas were met out, and also have to do the balancing that's happening here. I think for a lot of people who are suspicious of this kind of amendment, they would worry that this gives the courts a huge amount of power in terms of balancing. Uh, I think that's probably true, but it's one that doesn't, very, that doesn't really feel quite divorced from our current American jurisprudential context. You're already doing a huge amount of balancing when you're making any of these kind of decisions. We're just masking it under a series of small doctrinal tenets that move outward in variegated ways that people can't follow. Uh, the second, though, is I believe that this could be empirically pushed back by the way that this kind of gold standard of proportionality review has worked in the civil and common law jurisdictions. There, I think that you've seen that there has been a standardizing of the methodology that makes it eminently more transparent and actually makes it more effective. We also hope, of course, that this might then, in turn, avoid judicial abdication of their role in making these kind of decisions. 
Now, I know everyone in the room is probably quite familiar with the Williamson v. Lee optical decision uh, from quite a bit of time ago in which the Supreme Court overturned a highly nuanced district court decision that explained why the particular state rule uh, limiting access to like uh, people who wanted to make glasses and having to get prescriptions uh, was ultimately depriving an entire industry of property. And the Supreme Court instead said, no, rational basis, there's no reason for us to do this. That, that actually had huge ramifications uh, and resulted, I think, in one of the less reasoned opinions that the court has ever given. So in essence, then, we hope that this is actually going to promote the ideals of transparency, uh, making it easier to standardize what these kind of rules of decision would look like, protect these rights more effectively, and actually give back to the Congress more of a role in terms of deciding what these essential rights look like and what these limitations look like, and also why these ends should be done in the first place. Well, thank you very much. Um, so now we have comments from uh, Professor Myler from Stanford Law School. So I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to comment on Max and Duncan's fantastic amendment. Um, I will devote a little bit of time to trying to question a little bit this notion that um, the amendment does provide a transparent metric, um, but then also suggest a way in which um, some of its provisions resemble a part of our current jurisprudence, and finally talk about some of the difficulties that might be accrued from importing something from another constitutional context or uh, some of the questions that the judiciary might have to resolve if one did uh, ratify this amendment. So first of all, I want to look at um, the European Court of Human Rights, very similar uh, jurisprudence on uh, the question of what's necessary in a democratic society and also their uh, method of using proportionality review. Um, so in the European Court of Human Rights, uh, which is adjudicating the European Convention, um, there's been a lot of discussion of what's necessary in a democratic society. And I would say that I think there's a way in which um, looking to the ECHR jurisprudence is relevant to our polity in particular because they're dealing with a federal system um, in the same way that our court would be dealing with a federal system. So they're not dealing with uh, laws of the whole of Europe, but they are dealing with member state laws. And the doctrine of the margin of appreciation, which they've applied to uh, ascertain what might be necessary or review allegations of necessity in a democratic society by member states, uh, we could maybe also extrapolate to thinking about how the Supreme Court would uh, assess justifications by particular states of what might be necessary in a democratic society. So just to give you some examples of what has happened under the guise of of being necessary in a democratic society. Uh, the French have been able to pass a number of different kinds of laws uh, banning the veil in different locations, and that's been justified largely under what is thought of as necessary in a democratic society, and particularly within the French context. Um, likely, uh, also, um, there have been cases involving uh, how uh, kosher food is prepared, um, where uh, there's been an assessment that uh, alternative forms of preparation um, by particular groups is not uh, permissible uh, because it's uh, necessary in a democratic society to have one uh, provider of uh, kosher food. So there, there are a bunch of different kinds of cases on the religion front and then also on the speech front where restrictions on speech have been upheld because they're construed as necessary in a democratic society. So so um, that uh, is one maybe cautionary uh, lesson from the European Convention and Court on Human Rights uh, application of the principle of necessity in a democratic society. Um, so we might imagine that uh, President Trump's plan to change the libel laws would get more traction under the uh, approach of a court uh, applying a principle of necessity in a democratic society. Um, now, Similarly, I think um, proportionality uh, may be I also may lead, as I, I think Jamal Green mentions in um, one of his justifications, that you know we could see a change in jurisprudence if we import some of these limitations on rights. I think proportionality would probably cut back on certain speech and religion rights. Maybe it would uh, lead to more 
focus on other rights, um, and perhaps it would allow for uh, more latitude with respect to something like affirmative action um, than a strict scrutiny approach would. So we would maybe just see a, an alteration in the uh, kinds of rights and degree of protection of different kinds of rights under our Constitution. Now, um, turning briefly to the ways in which um, I think at least Section 2 um, actually is similar to certain aspects of our current system, I think that there's um, a way in which the specification of what a law has to do in Section 2 resembles what we currently think about in doing uh, Congress and proportionality analysis uh, for the 14th Amendment context. So um, when we think about uh, whether a statute uh, validly abrogates state sovereign immunity, um, then I think we do ask some similar questions. We look at whether uh, there's some right that is protected by the 14th Amendment that it is enforcing and whether uh, there is sufficient evidence for the necessity for protecting that right. So I think if we're going to imagine how that would be implemented, we might think about the 14.5 uh, context as a fruitful analogy there. Now, I know I only, I'm almost out of time, so I, I just want to conclude by saying that I think that um, the idea of importing a set of provisions from another constitutional context is very interesting and also raises a number of questions since it hasn't been something done before within the US context. Um, so one question that comes up is how we would interpret something like necessary. Would we interpret it in light of the jurisprudence of other countries or international bodies, or would we interpret it in light of our own jurisprudence of the necessary and proper clause or other, uh, other provisions in the Constitution? So um, that's one uh, set of questions that might arise. Um, and then secondly, I think I, it would be interesting to think about just more broadly the questions of legal transplantation involved and how much I, 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 importing uh, these standards from another uh, constitutional context um, would fit with the existing framework of the U.S. Constitution. So thanks so much and great. Thanks very much. Um, next up we have Jared Crum. I'm going to use the podium. Okay. Yeah. Be my guest. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah, there we go. Um, thanks very much. The first thing I want to flag is the fact that this is not my idea. This is my idea and Daniel Reichert's idea. Daniel had an unavoidable conflict, and he couldn't be here today, but I wanted to flag up from the fact that this was the result, this amendment is the result of our joint work. He's also a 2L, as am I. Um, the main problems we were trying to solve here are congressional gridlock and interest group and corporate capture uh, of the federal lawmaking process. And our solution to those problems uh, is a national popular ballot initiative. The most important feature of this amendment is that it's majoritarian. We're not hiding the ball on that. But we put significant counter-majoritarian breaks in it uh, to try to uh, alleviate any legitimate concerns uh, that we have and that anyone else might have with a national popular uh, ballot initiative. So there's a lot of text here. This is one of the longer amendments because it sets out a system, so I'll just very briefly say what it does. Section 1 amends the Article 1 Legislative Vesting Clause so that uh, now both Congress and the people through initiative have lawmaking power. Section 2 uh, says that popular enactments have equal status to congressional legislative enactments, and it explicitly provides for judicial review of popular enactments. Section 3 says that Congress governs uh, how this process works, how ballot, our initiatives are certified, it, and uh, significantly uh, it has uh, a sig required signatures range of 5 to 10%. Um, section 4 says when this is going to happen, it would happen in, uh, concurrent with the congressional elections every two years. And in order to win, you would need 50% plus one nationally. Uh, section 5 says you can't declare war or amend the Constitution uh, via initiative, which is probably a good idea, we think. Uh, and it also regulates how treaties would be ratified. 
through this process. Section six is a national right to vote. It's the first ever right to vote in our Constitution. And I know there have been some other proposals uh, in the conference to sort of dovetail with this one a little bit. Um, we put this in here because we didn't want to reproduce the same pathologies surrounding the franchise uh, that we currently have, and we wanted to make sure that a national initiative was actually truly rep had a more representative electorate uh, than we have right now, and Section 7 is your enforcement clause. Um, so there's a lot of reasons to be in favor of this, but these are uh, a few of the bigger ones. Rather than try to break gridlock by reforming or working within institutional veto gates in Congress and in the, the presidency, our proposal just bypasses them and goes straight to the people. It also has veto gates, but these veto gates are of a different sort uh, fundamentally, and they're a little bit fewer. We think it would, it would sort of speed the legislating process to just bypass Congress and the president entirely. No, no uh, bicameralism, no presentment. Um, it would make lawmakers harder to capture because there'd be 500, excuse me, instead of 535, there'd be potentially 130 million uh, that you need to capture, so you'd no longer uh, you know, it's easy to take a congressperson out to dinner. It's harder to take the whole country out to dinner. Uh, and now you might be thinking, but there are some people with the funds to do that. You're right, there are. I'll get to that uh, a little later. Um, but basically the idea here is we should put lobbying in public instead of in private. Uh, it would reduce the effect of gerrymandering and polarization by elevating national issues to a national forum uh, instead of uh, having, as some speakers have referenced, uh, today, the fact that Congress pays attention to its district first and national opinion second, we think that has certain pathologies for congressional gridlock uh, be because districts are gerrymandered. We'd like to get around that. Um, I really like the, oh, I, I want to underline the fact that Congress is, has very broad powers through Section 3 uh, to govern the uh, certification process. If Congress wants to make it easy, it can do that. It can have very lax uh, public notice. You'll notice there's public notice requirements. Those could be significantly loosened. But Congress could also tighten it up if it wants. It could go with the 10% signature threshold, uh, uh, meaning you would need 10% uh, signatures equal to the 10% of the electorate that voted in the last presidential election. Or it could make it as low as 5%. If you're worried about a King v. Burwell type drafting error uh, happening in popular legislation, totally reasonable. Congress could, if it wanted, say that the legislative, the nonpartisan legislative councils in each house have to take a look uh, at anything before it gets on the ballot um, to, to correct something like that. Congress could say you've got to get your signatures in by January if you want it on the ballot in November, or it could say August. There's just, there's very broad powers. We just put a few uh, parameters in there to make sure Congress couldn't, um, couldn't mess it up by our lights. And so that kind of flows into the signature part that I want to highlight. We really like the signature requirements here, 5%. Uh, if you went by 2016 turnout of 130 million people, that'd be, you'd need about 6 million signatures minimum. If Congress wanted to be really stringent, it could set it at 10%. That's about the same number of people that it takes to put a major party presidential nominee on the November ballot. So if you, if you want to think about these issues being somewhat analogous in their importance and the threshold that you should meet before you want to put something before the people in November, that's sort of what our signatures are designed to do. Um, designed to be high enough a floor to prevent parochial things, or to nix, yeah, parochial things, um, but we don't want Congress to make it 60% or something. Um, and again, review powers here are explicit. There's going to be judicial review. Congress can repeal if it wants. This doesn't take away any power from current branches. It only adds power in sort of, sort of a fourth quasi-branch. Congress can still legislate. Courts can still invalidate. The president can still slow. Uh, if he or she desires. Um, so I think people might be wondering, as I referenced before, uh, wouldn't you be worried that corporate interests uh, and special interests or interest groups would still dominate this process, the drafting process and the campaigning process, just like they currently do? Uh, we agree with that. We think that's a big criticism. We struggled with that when we were writing this. We went through several drafts of campaign, uh, campaign finance section, and we couldn't get it right. We couldn't figure out how to do it, and we were worried that it, start, it would be a little too much for one amendment. Um, but we think that we'd be certainly open to hearing everyone's suggestions for how to mitigate that problem so that we don't reproduce some of the campaign finance pathologies that Daniel and I see in the current system. Um, and we think that the fact that Congress can control this will alleviate that a little bit. Because again, Congress could say, we're going to have really big sunshine and disclosure requirements. 
uh, for ballot initiatives. We're going to put whatever campaign finance rules we can, consistent with the Constitution, uh, we're going to attach those to ballot initiatives. So the fact that there's congressional control here means that a Congress that's very inclined to put those types of sunshine laws on the system could. And again, it's going to be in public, uh, too. It takes lobbying out of receptions and puts it in the public uh, forum. You might also be thinking, wouldn't people just vote for uh, low taxes but lots of services uh, perpetually? Yeah, we think that's a big concern, too. And your answer to that will probably partially depend on how you feel about democracy generally and whether you think that majoritarianism is an OK thing uh, simply based on whether it brings good outcomes or whether your, ration, your justification for democracy is outcome independent or outcome neutral. Um, so if you, if, you are, if you are worried about that, one response might be to say, yes, that's true. Congress gets it wrong sometimes, too. The people get it wrong. Uh, you still have Congress. You still have the courts. You still have the executive uh, to counteract that if they wish. Um, you, you also might look at California's experience. California has filled budget holes recently. The legislature's done it. The governor's done it. Budget holes that may have been created by the people in the past. And actually, California voted to raise taxes uh, recently, a few months ago. Um, you might wonder, aren't urban areas and states and large states just going to dominate the small states? Wouldn't this be just an abolition of federalism? We don't think so because, first of all, uh, as I keep coming back to this, the other branches are not going away and they don't lose any of their power. So if there's pro-federalism forces in the other branches, they're certainly welcome uh, to counteract the people if they wish, uh, especially the courts because they're not elected. Uh, you still have states. States aren't going away. Uh, the way Texas um, acted under the Obama administration, the way California may act under the Trump administration, that would still be a dynamic that would exist. Um, that would not go away. Um, I looked, and if every single person in the most populous cities in the country voted uh, in favor of a ballot initiative, uh, you, uh, if they wanted to get a majority and not have any suburbanites and not have any rural voters join them, if they just wanted to impose their will, you would have to go all the way down to the 110th most populous city on the list. You'd have to go to Huntington Beach uh, in order to have cities be able to pass something alone, 65 million votes, if you're going off the 2016 numbers. And that's if, if, that's if children vote, uh, too, which is not even allowed. So really, it would be more. So cities could put something on the ballot by themselves. They could not pass it by themselves. Um, so I think that the most important thing to remember is that it, this is very majoritarian. There's nothing hidden about that. Um, we think that's good, but we also recognize that there need to be breaks in the process, uh, particularly uh, a break from a Congress that will remain always tied to districts and local interests uh, first and to national interests second. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So now we'll have comments from Michael Toth from the uh, Office of the Texas Attorney General. Uh, thank you again, uh, Michael McConnell and the uh, Stanford Constitutional Law Center for the invitation. And uh, thank you to Jared and to David for a very uh, thoughtful and thought-provoking and uh, well-drafted uh, constitutional amendment. Um, I'll start by uh, talking about a recent book by Tyler Cohen uh, on complacency. And uh, in Cohen's book, he talks about the decline in interstate mobility, uh, the decline in business startups, uh, the decline in rates of job changes, uh, the decline in American economic dynamism, uh, the decline in productivity growth. And it seems like the political analogy or uh, analog to that uh, is a decline in lawmaking, uh, a decline in the mobilization of broad political coalitions. Uh, one can see in uh, our, our legislative branch, at least uh, federally, uh, a certain sense of, of risk aversion, an inability to sort of move things forward, uh, a lack of a desire to make broad social changes, a lack of a desire to move an agenda, um, and I think uh, it's because of that uh, that we see, uh, from my perspective, sort of a slide into uh, executive lawmaking, a slide into judicial lawmaking. It's just a lot easier. Uh, it's too difficult uh, to expect uh, more work to be done uh, on the part of uh, the Congress. 
And uh, a positive uh, thing about uh, Jared and David's amendment uh, is that it, it reinvigorates the sort of lawmaking capacity. It doesn't do that by uh, enhancing the powers of Congress. It doesn't do that by hemming in the powers of the executive or the judiciary, but it does that, as Jared laid out in his presentation, directly by giving the people an ability to make laws at the federal level. Uh, what would be the effects of it? Uh, I guess it depends on your perspective. Uh, from the perspective of James Madison and Federalist 10, uh, it would be negative. James Madison said there that uh, representation provides a great point of difference between democracy uh, and a republic. Uh, re representatives uh, refine and enlarge the public's view. Uh, the enlightened views and virtuous sentiments of representatives in Madison views made them superior to the local prejudices and schemes of injustice uh, that drove democratic politics. Um, I think Madison's view is, was echoed earlier in a previous panel by Rich, uh, who in talking about uh, changing the selection of presidential candidates, um, noted that uh, there has been a rise of democratic romanticism uh, in recent years. Um, but there's other perspectives on this. Uh, Tocqueville, of course, authored the democracy, uh, the book Democracy in America. It's not titled Representation in America. Uh, and from Tocqueville's perspective, it is really the people who lead, uh, and even though the form of government is representative, it is obvious that the opinion, prejudice, interests, even the passions of the people can find no lasting obstacles that prevent them um, from making themselves felt in the daily direction of society. Uh, if you believe, as Jared laid out in his presentation, that Congress is pathological and dysfunctional, then obviously this provides a positive way forward. Or if you take my perspective, uh, that there, is, there has been an unfortunate slide into judicial and administrative overreach, uh, then it is a potentially attractive alternative. Um, I think we need to be uh, honest that the slide into administrative and judicial overreach is, is in part because uh, it is difficult and maybe too difficult for the formal lawmaking system to work. Uh, I do have a couple issues, though, uh, and I think I'd start maybe if you could just slide to section six, uh, which Jared covered. It's on the second of the two. Um, on voting, uh, section two of the 14th Amendment uh, allows states to abridge the franchise uh, by denying felons the right to vote. Um, so it seems as though there, there's a conflict between that, uh, section six and section two of the 14th Amendment, which I just flag. Um, many states obviously uh, uh, prevent uh, felons from voting on the, on the theory that if, if someone is convicted of not following the law, they can't uh, then go ahead and vote for, for lawmakers. It would seem like states would have that same objection to, to Section 6 when um, uh, individuals would be given the ability not just to vote for lawmakers, but to, to make law itself. Um, there's no registration requirement uh, for voting that's articulated in Section 6. Uh, so, which obviously exists in, in state voting uh, in federal elections. So the concern here would be that Section 6 would sort of create a kind of a two-track system where uh, if you're a U.S. citizen, you could vote in a ballot initiative on a federal ballot uh, every two years, um, and, and that's it, whereas you need to be registered uh, and other qualifications in order to, um, to vote for a congressional candidate or presidential candidate. Um, my time is running out, so I'll just make a couple last points. Uh, one is, um, uh, Bernie brought up in the pre previous presentation, sort of an importation problem. I think the importation problem here is there are many, many states which have ballot initiatives. They also have single subject requirements in their state constitutions. What that means is that every piece of legislation, including those that are uh, the products of ballot initiatives, can only address one subject. I would... Um, endeavor to say that I think when most people contemplate a ballot initiative, they're thinking about a sort of a single issue um, where the people come together and say, this isn't being represented by our legislators and they do a ballot initiative. That's part and parcel with that restriction in the state constitution. It's not in our federal constitution, and I think that may be something you'd add or have the Congress uh, address. Last thing I would say, and I'll end here, is perhaps think about having a 25% requirement where if it gets that many signatures, the Congress would have to vote on it. And my suggestion there, and this comes back to sort of my perspective about really wanting to harness legislative power, is give the legislators a chance. Uh, graft the power of the people onto the legislature. 
Uh, and that seems to me to sort of fulfill the, the goal that you lay out uh, and the goal that some uh, have laid out in previous presentations, which is we need a reinvigorated Congress as well. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So next we have James Davidson uh, from Stanford Law School. Good afternoon. My amendment gives Congress the power to regulate independent political expenditures that in many ways have the same corruptive potential that campaign contributions do. In Buckley v. Vallejo, the Supreme Court struck down limits on independent expenditures, declaring that such spending should be treated as pure speech. More recently, the court in Citizens United extended those protections to independent expenditures made by corporations and unions. The court, however, has upheld limits on campaign contributions. The discrepancy in these outcomes is due to the court's belief that independent expenditures do not pose the same corruptive potential that direct contributions do. I believe that independent expenditures can pose a, sim a similar corruptive potential. Indeed, the amount of influence that wealthy individuals and corporations have garnered through their ability to make unlimited independent expenditures raises significant doubts about the court's reasoning. Just as members of Congress actively seek campaign contributions, I believe they are also eager to curry favor with those who can spend millions of dollars on advertisements for or against them. It seems counterintuitive then to allow limits on campaign donations while not placing similar restrictions on independent expenditures. My amendment seeks to respect important freedom of speech concerns by only targeting independent expenditures that pose the greatest risk of corruption. It is vital that citizens are able to freely support the candidates of their choice, either through direct contributions or independent expenditures. Independent expenditures are certainly entitled to at least the same protections that campaign contributions are, and this amendment enshrines this baseline. To be certain that Congress does not target spending not directly related to an election, I've included temporal constraints. I've also included the clarifying language of explicit to distinguish these candidate-centric expenditures from issue-based ads or other expenditures that do not raise the same level of corruption concerns. An individual should be able to spend freely to express their opinions. However, when these expenditures explicitly support or oppose a federal candidate in the run-up to an election, Congress should be able to install restrictions comparable to donation limits that lower the risk of undue influence. While not discussed in this amendment, I certainly endorse more public financing of elections, uh, like Professor Chichow was talking about earlier. A combination of less corporate money and more public money could go a long way to making our government more responsive to the interests of all Americans. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so with comments, we have Zephyr Tichot from Fordham University. Thank you. You shocked me by, by limiting your time. But <laughs> uh, so, so thank you. This is really interesting and, and thoughtful and a well-crafted um, amendment. I just want to point out some things that I think are interesting in it. Um, you know, uh, one of the things that is interesting is that there's no press exception. So almost all of the post-Citizens United um, uh, overturn Citizens United uh, proposals, many of which do very um, more than overturn Citizens United, include a press exception. So what that means, and I, I took this as a deliberate, perhaps it's not, um, but that you were sort of deliberately confronting head on one of the most difficult issues in um, uh, uh, independent expenditures and saying, no, I'm actually okay with a 30 or 60 day time period in which the New York Times can't um, uh, make an endorsement. <laughs> And I'm willing to give that 30 or 60 day up. The New York Times can still report on candidate activity but cannot make this um, endorsement. And the, the, the cost, as I took it, of giving that up is outweighed by the ability to have a, um, a very clear line that there's going to be no corporate expenditures during this time. Um, another thing that I thought was interesting was the choice of explicit. 
So with explicit, there's two things that you did not do, although I think one, I think you kind of did one. One of the things you did not do is reinvigorate or sort of constitutionalize the McCain-Feingold idea that naming a candidate during this time period to a relevant targeted electorate. So McCain-Feingold said if you got the name and the relevant targeted electorate during these time periods, this is, a, this is gonna be a problem. Instead, you said it has to be an explicit support or opposition of a candidate. And what you didn't do is, um, which was interesting, then engage the language from Wisconsin Right to Life, although this feels like an engagement of Wisconsin Right to Life, a 2007 decision which um, struck down um, an as-applied challenge to McCain-Feingold saying that uh, if you use the name and relevant target electorate, that's not enough. There needs to be no other reasonable interpretation um, of the ad at this time. But basically, I feel like, uh, except for the use of the word individual, you're reviving Wisconsin right to life standard by using um, explicit terminology. Um, it's, it's great to have the senator here. I'm sure he remembers. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> What this means for those of you not steeped in election law is that um, ads can run, and this, these are the ads from the 2004 Senate race, that um, the, there's, there's this radio ad where a guy says, do you take this man to be your uh, wife? And, uh, or sorry, do, who, will, who is here to give the bride away? And the father of the bride says, I am, but first I wanna talk to you about drywall. And then the voiceover, I know it's, it's not even a very good ad. <laughs> Then the voiceover says, some things are too important. Uh, we've got a problem with uh, Feingold's approach towards the filibuster. Call Feingold now. Tell him to change his position on the filibuster. All of this within um, the, the time period right before the election. There's a whole series of these kinds of ads that developed um, over many, many years um, that uh, would not be covered by your um, amendment, um, where uh, individuals or corporations or unions could uh, use unlimited power, even with your amendment, to name, shame, um, accuse um, sitting candidates within this time period. And I, I think that gets to the real question of, of um, the question that I would ask you. Um, except for, the, and the last thing that's really interesting here is the use individual, so that you're basically overturning, uh, overturning Buckley's um, decision on individual which you addressed. But, but at core, I think what you're, what's, what's interesting here is, is a question, like how much did Citizens United make a difference? And how much would overturning Citizens United and only overturning Citizens United, getting back to 2007, change the political landscape? And I think there's, there's the, too often those two get tied together and I actually think there's two different answers to that. One is that Citizens United made an enormous difference. It made an epic difference. It totally changed elections. For down-ballot candidates, um, the dominant, down-ballot candidates in close race or in swing districts, like my, my race, I ran for Congress, 17 million spent, uh, over, about nine of that was outside money. Um, so the dominant way in which um, citizens hear about candidates is now through um, Citizens United enabled spending. And there's no doubt that that came because of Citizens United. On the other hand, it's not obvious that overturning Citizens United and only overturning Citizens United would lead to being back in 2009 because Citizens United led to a cultural change where um, individuals like Robert Mercer using a technique enabled by Citizens United are now newly engaged. It's like, it was like the gateway drug. And then there's this massive corporate and individual engagement in elections as part of people's livelihood, or not livelihood, part of their sort of system of political engagement, um, that uh, merely going back to 2009 would not change that cultural change. And instead, they would use other mechanisms, including issue ads, to perform the same kind of behaviors. So although I think it's very exciting, I don't think it actually gets uh, it goes far enough given what has already happened with the cultural change after Citizens United, but great job. Well, thank you very much. Um, is this thing working? Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I think next we actually have an exciting proposal. Um, we'll, 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 so we'll take, we'll take a few minutes for questions and then we have a, an exciting exercise in collective del deliberation uh, for everybody. But first questions, so. 
I'll let Jamal, Professor uh, Green. So, so, uh, so I just wanted to say just a little bit about the proportionality amendment. Uh, uh, first, I'm very happy to see that the fight is joined, and I, uh, uh, it is, it's partly joined, uh, and I'm quite sympathetic to the amendment. Uh, just a couple of concerns that I have that I think actually point to why I use the language that I use. And um, one is in section two uh, of the um, proposed amendment, which is the con it's Congress or a state legislature, I guess. Um, uh, or, I, I, I mean, I don't know if this is just legislatures, um, but potentially an executive as well, uh, uh, specifying the right that's being restricted um, uh, if, if, uh, if it on its face violates its, uh, a constitutional right. Uh, I, I think it's, it's atypical for a state legislature or, or Congress to understand itself to be violating a constitutional right when it legislates. Um, uh, and so uh, both because of a bona fide belief uh, at the time of legislation and because um, doing so in print would expose it to litigation risk that um, the legislature is quite unlikely to want to invite. Uh, and so uh, if, the pur if the purpose is to invite a kind of dialogue between the legislature and the courts about uh, proportionality analysis and the various steps, uh, one could do that on the back end, for example, through some form of legislative remand um, or through um, a suspension of invalidity or some other mechanism. Um, the other concern is on section three, and um, this goes to this, this question of how specific one should be about the interest that government's protecting. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm uncomfortable in a constitution specifying um, the substantive values for which a legislature can legislate. Uh, and as I look at the list here, public order, national defense, public health, the rights of others, or to remedy structural inequality or ensure equal, rep equal representation, quite apart from the, the controversy that, that would in, some of those would engender, uh, you know, if I wanted to pass a law protecting cruelty to animals, let's say, I think it doesn't fit into any of those, uh, which isn't to say that um, one must have such laws. It's to say that, uh, that in a constitution that's very difficult to amend, uh, unlike the, the basic law of Germany, for example, uh, one, one should be worried about specifying uh, the values that, that, that are, are worthy of legislation at any given time. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so I think both of those are, are fascinating. For the point to section two, I think our concern there was how one would bring challenges. Uh, we had this debate about framing it as on its face or applied challenges. And by not including on its face, uh, we worried that then there would be uh, a sense in which you couldn't bring an as applied challenge. Uh, because you, know, you, you could say like, oh, they've already not done the background work for uh, limiting this right, and so therefore they fail section two at, at the forefront. We don't even have to get into whether or not this is a, a balancing issue. Uh, so we included the on its face language there to make it so that when there were laws that were passed that did directly limit this right, then you could have that kind of backgrounded move. Uh, I, I think that that challenge, that that critique that you provide is, is valid, but it, it does seem in essence that there are specific laws that very much do facially restrict a right. And you can pretend that they don't, uh, but it, it just doesn't seem quite accurate in how it would turn out empirically. And I don't know if Duncan has anything else he wants to add to that. Um, well, yeah, thanks for the comments. I mean, nothing I think I'd like to add to that in particular, but um, just on the, maybe on the point of, of specifying these values. Um, I mean, I, I, th I think the first thing to, to say is that, um, uh, you know, I think we had a sort of shared um, meta goal in proposing these, which is just to tease out some of the challenges of proportionality analysis and and um, spelling out the specific conditions. Um, it would be interesting to have a debate about what those should actually be. Um, and I and I think this also gets to some of Bernie's points that um, you know. Uh, that I think what's exciting about the amendment is that there's an opportunity to debate what what the terms actually mean, and we don't necessarily need to import what you know what it means in other contexts. So you know, uh, cruelty to animals maybe maybe that is uh, a public health concern, uh, or, or or hate speech. I, I think you were alluding to you know maybe maybe that is fundamental to the way that we think about democracy, and so the Europeans can interpret democracy one way and we interpret it another. But um, I think setting a standard that is transparent that citizens can actually debate as opposed to 
courts drawing lines fairly arbitrarily is, is one of the exciting things about the amendment. Okay, Professor Lanamore. Yes, um, so in support of the, the citizen initiative proposal, I just wanted to mention two examples that um, you may want to look at as, as a way to, you know, be more optimistic about the potential of something like this and perhaps refine the proposal. One is from Finland, where they have a citizen initiative since 2012. And uh, it's, it's a bit different from what you have in mind because, in fact, it's just um, you, you need uh, 50,000 signatures within six months to put a proposal to parliament who then has to debate and engage and decide something. So um, since 2012, there's only one law that came out of that initiative. initiative. It's um, the marriage equality law. So it's a big achievement, you might say, that came straight from the people. Uh, and it was blocked for years in, in Parliament, so that's a good example. Um, uh, the first one that, that was put to, to, to Parliament that didn't go through was um, a ban on fur farming in northern Finland, so that was, but that was debated. But what I want to point out is that even though only one law came out of this process in five years so far, 700 have been discussed, I think, something like that, and the impact on the public debate has been enormous. It's really... Um, uh, reinvigorated the public sphere, if you want, and f made citizens feel sort of engaged. So that's another side <coughs> byproduct by of that sort of thing. The other thing you may want to look at is the, the proposal in the uh, 2012 constitutional proposal in Iceland. So it, this never was applied, but they, they have two very interesting uh, articles in this, uh, in this new constitutional proposal. One is a, a right of referral. 10% of the population can ask for a law to be put to a referendum. And then they also have something like a citizen initiative where two person can put something on the agenda, 10 person can actually offer a law. I mean, it's, it's, uh, there are many ways to articulate these sort of ideas of citizen initiative. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, one of the side benefits that I didn't have time to talk about that I think might be something that would come out of a process like this would be greater citizen engagement, greater, um, we already have a raucous public sphere and even more raucous public sphere. Uh, robust uh, and wide open. Um, and there'd be, uh, not just for people either, not just for individuals, but also for parties too. This would be a great uh, opportunity for parties to road test future candidates for national office. Uh, if they wanted to champion an initiative of their own nationwide, they could go do it all over the country uh, in an off year. So there's, there's a lot of second order effects and it's good to hear that um, that's what's happened in Finland even though they've only had one so far. Okay, we'll take a question to the left there. Yeah, well, one of the spillover effects will be that I can't go to Trader Joe's without a great increase in the number of petitions uh, you know, outside Trader Joe's. But <clears throat> I have a more serious uh, question, which is that if the initiative power is a devolution of the legislative power that belongs to Congress, doesn't that suggest that presidential veto of one of these initiatives comes into play? I did not see anything in the proposal to deal one way or the other with the right of the president to veto an initiative that has been passed in this manner. So that's the first question. The second question deals with the issue of major majoritarianism, and I'm glad you're upfront about that, but I worry about that a lot, because in order for a bill to become law in the Congress, setting to one side the non-veto or the, you know, the, the passage by the president, you have to go through the committee process. If, if, for example, if somebody in Congress were to propose a 100% income tax on people with incomes above $100,000, that would never get anywhere because it would never get through the committee process. And individual legislators would be concerned about their own reelection should they support something like that. When you have a devolution of political power down to the people, you might well get majoritarian instincts actually passing something like that with nobody having political responsibility for it. Yeah, these are good points. So the, as to the first one, we structured section one of the amendment so that it's not a delegation or a devolution of power from Congress to the people. Rather, it's amending the ve legislative vesting clause, which currently says all legislative powers granted in this Constitution are vested in uh, Congress of the United States, ours just adds another entity that now has equal legislative power. So it won't be a, a delegation, it won't be a devolution, you just have two lawmaking entities now. One That's of them the Congress, and we said, we said the Congress, not a Congress, I think Article 1 says a Congress because we didn't want anyone to think we were accidentally restarting Congress anew uh, with our amendment, so it's just still the same Congress. Um, so the, that's, that's why we sort of phrase section one like that. And so for section, 
So for your second question. But, but on um, the first question, could the president veto? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, the veto thing. So no, there's no veto. It's just this is another way to make law. So method one is bicameralism and presentment and maybe and veto if, and override. Uh, and method two is this, uh, con congressional certificate. Signatures, congressional certification, ballot. So yeah, that's, that's the veto angle. And that was on purpose. We talked about that. We debated that. We really wanted to make it a totally separate process rather than um, hang on to some of the stuff from the old process. Um, so to the second question, yeah, we're also really worried about quality of the legislation or wisdom of the legislation or something that, or to, to take another example, um, yeah, you, what if you had an economic meltdown and people wanted to, to you know, 100% tax or after a terrorist, or, you know, what if people were in a panic after a terrorist attack? We deliberately in Section 3 didn't give that many, uh, we gave Congress broad powers in Section 3 to govern how certification works precisely so that if Congress wanted uh, to slow things down, require a very long public run-up, of a campaign before something gets on the ballot uh, by setting the signature, you know, signatures have to be in by February or something like that. Again, like I said in the talk, maybe they want to require the proposals to have to go through the nonpartisan legislative councils in Congress. Maybe they set up an independent panel that has to vet them. Maybe they even send them through a congressional committee. Um, although that one would, I think that wouldn't, I wouldn't like that one, uh, but arguably they might be able to do it. Um, so I think that that's why we, structured section three the way we did, precisely for the concerns you raised, because we don't want poorly drafted, uh, we, we want this Congress, for example, Ryan McConnell, to be able to, if they want, make it very hard for people to pass 100% income tax. And we want a future Congress, whoever, whoever leads that, a Democratic Congress, you know, to be able to uh, be very solicitous of people's, of people's basic rights, what, whatever, what have you. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's basically the answer to your question is Congress can decide and Congress will decide. Yeah, thank you. Well, we're running a little short on time, so why don't we take Professor uh, Greve and Levinson's questions uh, in, uh, one after the other. So uh, Professor Levinson, you go first, and then Professor Greve, and then um, our panelists can briefly respond. And if you could keep your questions to just one point, right. uh, that would be helpful. Right. Mine is with regard to the Alderman Amendment. Um, as somebody who obsesses about McCulloch versus Maryland, I can't help but notice that you twice use the word necessary. And so I can't help but be curious whether necessary means absolutely necessary as an Article 1, Section 10, or merely convenient or useful as in McCulloch versus Maryland. Professor Kelly? Yeah, it's on the same amendment, so it may be. Best to, look, Excellent. I'm here to tell you the beer is still much better over there. Same is true of the jurisprudence. And just <laughs> let me say one word about how much better. Um, it's, no, the constitutional stuff comes with a whole lot of surrounding doctrines that are very, very important and hang together with it. Okay, so most of the things, the rights violations we obsess over and get concerned over are in fact administrative measures. Right? And so you have to think about how this hangs together with administrative law. And the doctrines they have make your teeth rattle. Right? You get de novo review on all questions of law in fact. Wow. And then they have a delegation doctrine that says that the legislature must make all essential decisions itself. Wow, that has real teeth. Right? And so then think through cases like Hobby Lobby or if you're worried about money, which they still are and we aren't, think about cases like Rapanos, Sackett. Before you even get to any constitutional proportionality test, those things are out under the existing really serious rule of law constraints that you have under administrative law. And I wonder whether you've sort of thought about the larger way in which this amendment fits into the sort of ad law slash rule of law culture. Why don't you guys go first? Uh, yeah, so I, I think you're absolutely right to point out the, the McCulloch language. We did consider it more in that light. Uh, we talked about it with Bernie actually before uh, presenting. Uh, there I think you didn't, we didn't want to have I think the kind of strict, absolutely essential necessary language that we required for that kind of tailoring just because it does give rise to such immediate fatal in fact 
kind of inquiries. And instead, it, it should have been a little bit fudgier. And I, I think that it's somewhat reminiscent of kind of the Canadian court's guidance uh, on this uh, issue that they provide in RGR McDonald Inc. v. Canada, uh, which says that you sort of have to present reasonable additional alternatives and then to refrain from selecting the most restrictive among them in terms of the right. Thank you so much. I mean, the short answer is no. Uh, we haven't thought about any of those complexities, and neither of us know really anything about German law. So um, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I know significantly more about German beer than I know about German law. Um, but so I, I think, um, you know, I think the, it, it's all well taken, and I would really love to learn more about it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, well, <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Well, join me in thanking our panel. And now...